uh, what an honor it is for Melinda and me to be here tonight, and what an emotional experience as well. We came in the fourth year, and we stayed for 16, and to say that those years were among the best years of our life would be an understatement. And 19 years later, I literally dream about CHS. And in some of those dreams, John Nair appears <laughs> in my office with his next project. In our experience of serving Christian schools here in the U.S. and in a dozen countries throughout Europe, we've discovered something we always suspected, and that is that CHS is like school, as a school like none other. And tonight, the memories come cascading down. Too many to share, but a few we must. And as we do, we hope you'll see examples of the core values upon which this school was built that change lives and last forever. Things like unshakable faith in God, the foundation of prayer, adherence to his word, deep love for kids, passion for Christ-centered education, partnership with the home and the church, pursuit of excellence, gifted godly teachers standing in the gap, and most of all, <clears throat> a continuous desire to glorify God in all things. And now, 40 years later, CHS is all these things, thanks to countless visionary Christians, many of whom are here in this room tonight. Melinda and I remember first and foremost the deep love the Andersons had for kids in Christ, their awesome vision for Christian education, and their remarkable generosity. And I wanted you to know that I remember so vividly <clears throat> that after honoring the Lord, I wanted to honor the Andersons more than anything else because their vision had become a reality. And Mrs. A, what a privilege it was to serve with you and pastor during those years, 16 of them. And Melinda and I count it among the greatest blessings of our life. We also remember how the board took a chance <clears throat> on a public school principal with an early education experience my first job with seven-year-old children. And the charge that I was given as I accepted the job, and it went like this. We want you to honor the statement of faith. We want you to hire additional qualified teachers, build grades 10, 11, and 12, develop a program of excellence, spiritual and academic, get the school accredited, get the kids into good colleges and universities, and establish a fine, universe, a fine reputation within the community. And when you've done all that, take a deep breath, we've got more. <laughs> a daunting task to say the least, <clears throat> but God showed his great strength in our weakness and he did it. And I often say as I travel that the two most important things that are essential in building a school of excellence, the right leaders, and that includes the board, and the right teachers. There are many other details that are important, but those two need to be in place. So I want to highlight those in the few minutes that I have here. I want to tell you, first of all, that happily some very excellent teachers, as Jay has already mentioned, were in place providing a strong foundation. And as we grew, God led us to others, people like John Nair, people like Jim Baer, people like Dan Vinton, just to name a few, who are still here more than three decades later expressing their love and commitment to kids in Christ. And this continuity of staff stabilized the school and gave it great strength. And from those early days, I remember this remarkable lady named June Vanger, <clears throat> who uh, was so reluctant to leave the classroom, to take on the role of lower school principal, and how blessed the children and the parents were when she did. I remember Randy Matthews, who pledged to give us two years as chaplain and Bible teacher in the high school, and then giving us 10. I remember Andrea Cordon's gentle spirit in the kindergarten, instilling love and kindness in children. I remember Carol Smith coming to school early every day to sit in the chair of every child to pray for that child. And Dan Vinton's determination that every child would succeed in his math class and John Nair's investment in developing Christ-like character in the athletic field, which helped shape the very fabric of countless athletes. Just as an aside, 
I interviewed over at least eight or nine teachers for that PE athletic director position. I just didn't feel we had the right person until I was connected with John. And I didn't know that beyond getting a PE teacher and an athletic director, I was getting a visionary, an architect, and many other things. And John, I am so grateful. I remember Jim Baer's Herculean efforts to teach his children, his students, how to write and how many returned as alumni to thank him. And I remember when Bruce Stempian accepted the role of college counselor in, placement, uh, in the placement program, that it allowed me to uh, take a deep breath, stop worrying, and to once again get a good night's sleep. And I remember my wife's selfless efforts behind the scene and how she was always my greatest cheerleader. And I remember my brother and friend, Steve Taylor, and how we were kindred spirits in taking the school forward. And what a gift you were to CHS, Steve. And I remember John Slifka, who had the nickname of the greatest schlepper in the world, <laughs> who single-handedly filled this school, <clears throat> every one of its classrooms and offices, with free furniture and quality desks. And I remember my daughter, Tricia, very young, probably in fourth grade, and we were off on a schlepping trip in the foundation's dump truck uh, with its big uh, plow on the front. And she said when we came back, Dad, you, Mr. Slifka, and Mr. Taylor are the leadership team of the school. Should you really be traveling together on the dangerous highways? <laughs> that caused me to think a little bit, but we kept doing those trips. And I remember this lady named Grace Karika the sweetest secretary a new head of school could ever have, appearing at my door from time to time and, <clears throat> and saying gently, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> and as I thought about it, I was sure I didn't because this was a wise lady. And Melinda and I will always remember with deep gratitude as parents, the investment of the teachers and the support staff and the lives of our own children passing on the heritage of Christ and reinforcing everything we believed in. And we're not surprised that all 12 of our grandchildren have gone on to Christian schools because of the influence of the teachers here on their parents. The Bible says that a student when fully trained will be like his teacher, but the question really is, what teacher do we want them to be like? And the answer comes quickly, it's the teachers here at CHS. Where else can one find this level of commitment and investment in children and young people? CHS teachers are truly the heart of the school, the living curriculum, as the Portuguese would say in describing the best thing in the world, the gold on blue velvet, transform, transforming lives in ways that will last forever. And then I remember the vision and the passion and the incredible work ethic of the board, people like Ed Morgan and Arnie Trillip, Bill Barker, Bob Wilson. It's always dangerous to mention names because uh, surely I'll forget some key people who work so hard to support our families, to serve our families and our teachers, to preserve unity and push us toward excellence. I remember so many long nights in board meeting rooms where we agonized over tuition versus salary, having a burden for both our staff and our families. And I remember the year that we expected a very large deficit in the range of $20,000. And we ended the year with a surplus of $2.22. <laughs> and that year was a cause for great celebration. And I remember the free tuition the board offered to a number of students coming out of the city who were living below the poverty level and how well I remember one of those students stepping to this podium as valedictorian of her class. And then I remember a fellow headmaster telling me that my honeymoon with the board would surely end someday as it had for him. And you know, it never did. I remember the eight months it took for a diverse committee of people to create the mission statement that has remained essentially unchanged for 36 years. And it's so good to know that you've ever been true to that mission. I remember the trip that a very ill David Hay made to the White House 
where he moved President Reagan to tears with his testimony and courage. And I remember vividly how the school community embraced the Hay and Taylor families following the deaths of David and Jimmy to illness and accident. I remember in those early days how just a few families left the school while the majority, the loyal majority, trusted us to figure it all out. What were they thinking? And many of those parents prayed for us through every step of the way. Many of them came to this school every Wednesday, every week, every month, every year to pray for the needs of the school. And I remember that special day when we stood at the Copley Plaza Hotel and received our accreditation award from the president of Harvard University as he represented the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And I remember the many pastors who enrolled their children here, spoke in chapel, faithfully supported this school. And I remember the visit of astronaut Jim Irwin, whose faith in Christ and piloting of the lunar module for Apollo 15, 15 inspired us all. And those are the kinds of people, the quality of people that we wanted to put in front of our kids. And of course, I remember that momentous day in 1984 when we graduated our first class and our first graduate, Nick Adam, who's here tonight. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share at least a few of the lighthearted moments during those years, for laughter and joy lurked around every corner of the school. There was a time we allowed the seniors to assemble a Volkswagen in John Neer's office. <laughs> there was the unforgettable moment when a little child, his grandparents are here tonight, received a lollipop from me in my office and she went running to her mother and said, Mommy, Mommy, look what God gave me. And I remember, remember the time I was called down to Barb DeVries' uh, second grade classroom, a little boy is misbehaving, and as we walked down the hall, he burst into tears and he said words I'll never forget. This won't hurt my resume, will it? <laughs> <clears throat> I assured him it wouldn't. And then there was the night that I spent on the roof and uh, sub-freezing temperatures after the lower school kids met the challenge of reading 8,000 books and getting interviewed while in bed by the local radio station. And there was the morning that Chris Vanderbon in the science class on April, April Fools lowered the skeleton, the science skeleton down in front of the window of my office. And then there was the morning I came to school and saw all the kids chuckling as I walked into my office and found a pony grazing there. <clears throat> and I could go on and on. But most of all, you know what I remember? What we all remember is that God orchestrated everything that was good about this school, and he continues to 40, day, 40 years later to this very evening. And apart from him, CHS would not exist as a spiritual and intellectual influence in the community and a force for change, counterculture for Christ. And so tonight we honor God above all things for his faithfulness in building this remarkable school in which his word is preeminent and his children are so valued. And beneath all the blessings and all the milestones and, and the lighthearted moments of the school's 40-year history, there's always been something very serious going on in this place that makes it so essential. From its founding, we've all known, and everyone here gathered in this room tonight knows, that if we don't teach children to know and love Jesus Christ, that the world will teach them not to. And that's why it's so important that CHS exists now 40 years. And for all these years, there's been an invisible battle raging for the hearts and minds of our kids and those who love Jesus Christ have collectively stood with parents for four decades to win that battle. The early church leaders, we find in Mark chapter 10, rebuked the children, wouldn't let them get to Jesus. And Jesus said, let the children come and forbid them not. And he rebuked the disciples by embracing the, the children and blessing them. And set in place our mandate for Christian education for centuries to come. Those simple words, let the children come. 
And today, in so many places as we travel around the world, we have church leaders that are like those disciples that are not supporting the Christian school in partnership with the family and the church. And this is a phenomenon which I believe is the single greatest impediment to the expansion, even explosion, of Christian schools worldwide. But CHS, CHS is different. This place is different. Because when Jesus said, let the children come, a pastor said, let them come here. And other pastors, numerous pastors over the years, some of whom are gathered here tonight, agreed and said, yes, let them come here. As my time comes to a close, I want to share just quickly a couple of stories of changed lives and battles won. I was in the kindergarten one, one day telling the Easter story, and I got to the place where Jesus had died on the cross, and a little girl named Hannah de Block jumped to her feet, and she said, Mr. Brown, he didn't stay dead, he's alive. And so I didn't know. And it was one of the most beautiful nights, one of the most beautiful days, rather, of my time here at CHS. I ran into her father a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and he, uh, I said, what's Hannah like today? By the way, she's an opera singer, and she's probably about 40 now. He said, just the same, telling people who will listen, he didn't stay dead, he's alive. And how did that happen? It happened in partnership with the home and the church and the school. And then there was a young lady named Jennifer. She came to us in her early high school years. And uh, she was not a believer. But the teachers loved her. They raised her up in truth. They provided a quality education. Her classmates embraced her. And one day she made a decision that jeopardized her standing at the school. And we brought her in. We wanted to simply instruct her. We wanted to possibly give her a consequence. But most of all, we wanted to forgive her and restore her but she refused. She was angry. She denied what she had done, so we brought her father in. And her father said, what she did was not so bad. Many people do that. You don't deserve my daughter. I'm taking her out of the school. And he did, and we never saw her again. And the teachers were heartbroken. And they said, what did we do? What could we have done differently? I said, nothing. You were faithful to the charge. You loved her in the Lord. Let's let the Holy Spirit work in her life and trust him for that. And then we forgot all about her, or at least I did. And seven years later, Grace Carica walked in the office, and Steve was with me, and handed us a letter. I opened the letter, and it said, Dear Mr. Brown, it's me, Jennifer. And I looked to the bottom of the letter to see which Jennifer, and when I realized... I was in shock. Seven years ago, I did something very wrong at the school. I knew it was wrong then. I denied it. I know it's wrong now. And I want to confess it. And I want to ask you and Mr. Taylor if you'll please forgive me and will you write to me with your answer? And she said further, <clears throat> will you please find the teachers that are here at the school now, that were here, that were there seven years ago, would you gather them together, tell them, I confess my sin, and I ask them if they would please forgive me, and would you write to me and tell me what they say? And then there was more. She said, I want you to know that the two years I spent at CHS were the best two years of my life. There I was introduced to the one that loves me, the one that died for me, the one that lives for me today. And as a result of what happened in that school, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And then she went on to say, I've married a fine, godly young man, and we have a little girl. And when she grows big enough, we're going to look for a school for her just like CHS. Something stunning has been happening at this school for 40 years. This partnership of the home and the church and the school has been producing counterculture Christians for Christ, whose faith is not being shaken as they move beyond our influence. And it's essential that we here gathered tonight continue our investment in the lives of these little ones and these not-so-little ones. And the reason is that time is short. Time goes quickly and the task is urgent. And little people, these little ones in the kindergarten, become big people in the blink of an eye. 
and then they're gone. And the possibility of our influencing them for Christ is gone with it. So good for Melinda and I to join you here tonight, celebrating 40, 40 years of God's faithfulness upon CHS. Truly a school set apart, truly a school like none other, and a school that she and I still call home. Thank you so much.